This is part two of Capitalism, It's Home, and Harriet Fraud, or if you want to title Dr. Harriet Fraud, talking about mass murder and talking about, in particular, school shootings and why they're happening within the context of the mass murders that are everywhere in the United States and nowhere else to this extent. Well, part of it is a national problem. We never really converted to a peacetime economy after World War II. The one way in which the United States leads the world is the production of military equipment. And we are also in over 80 countries as a military presence. We have been at war almost continuously since World War II. Even though we have not won any of those wars, we're still at war, spending a lot of money on equipment that's destroyed, and so we have to get more. And I want to emphasize how the United States has more military equipment than the next at least four, and some people think seven, countries that are most militarized in the world. We went to war in Korea. That was a draw. We did not win. We went to the war in Vietnam. That was a draw. We didn't win. We had the war in Iraq. We lost. We lost even though we spent $1.9 trillion. And it took us about seven years to lose. We were at war in Afghanistan, where we spent over $3 trillion. And it took 20 years to lose. However, we did spend vast billions of our tax dollars, and we also destroyed a whole lot of military hardware that had to be replaced. I ought to mention as an aside that the only thing that America stockpiles is military equipment. We don't stockpile extra infant formula, even though infants need that to survive. We don't stockpile extra pandemic equipment so that when a pandemic occurs, we're prepared because really What capitalists need is to turn over their merchandise. They need it sold. But there's an exception with military hardware, and there's always more trillions on the military. The U.S. just sent the latest $40 billion to the Ukraine. That's $40 billion that Americans didn't receive for ourselves. And it's very interesting how that worked. In 1989, Gorbachev asked to join NATO. He said, there's no point in NATO anymore. There is no hostility or no Cold War that's necessary. Cold War is always a good excuse to make armaments. We can have unity, and the United States and Gorbachev made a a joint statement where the United States would not surround Russia with hostile countries that had formerly been part of the Soviet bloc, and there would be peace. Of course, there wasn't. So in 2014, another agreement was made that the U.S. would not invite any other countries on the Soviet border into NATO. And that promise was broken. And it was broken because America, with its war economy, is falling behind. Our empire is not what it used to be. Our growth rate as a nation is 2% or under a year. China's growth 
rate is 8.1% a year. China has 12 high-speed railways racing across China. We have none. China lifted 880 million people out of extreme poverty. More people have entered poverty in the United States. Something's really wrong, and we're not going to correct it by trying to create wars. Leon Panetta stated that he would, our wish, in case people don't know him, he was a high official in the um, previous government, that our objective will be to weaken the alliance between Russia and China by weakening Russia, by trying to induce them into a war that's a long-lasting war so they will exhaust their treasury. Just as we help precipitate the fall of the Soviet Union by creating a Cold War armaments race that the Soviet Union really couldn't match and also provide prosperity to its people who then rebelled. They hope to exhaust Russia and keep Russia and China from uniting and becoming a more powerful empire than the United States, which is losing its power. It's no accident that although the United States has tried to involve the whole world in our crusade against Russia and joining us in the support of the Ukraine against Russia, South America as an entire continent has refused. That wouldn't have happened in the 50s when we were the power. Africa has refused. They have alliances with China and now with Russia. And so the Ukrainian people are being used and dying by the thousands in order to change the balance of power and put the United States on top. And we are spending trillions of dollars on this. Meanwhile, we're suffering. The American people are suffering. Now it's a little over 40% of America. Four out of 10 Americans don't have $400 on hand or they could easily borrow in case of the most dire emergency. Just in New York alone, 220,000 people are suffering eviction when the eviction moratorium has worn off, which it has. And our Governor Adams has allowed rents, even in rent-stabilized and rent-controlled apartments, to go up between 4 and 8% when people can't even afford to pay their back rent that they didn't have to pay when they were all through the pandemic and they didn't have the money. People are suffering terribly. Also, in the American empire, People are opting out. 20 million Americans have dropped out of the labor force. because they And the biggest cause, according to the studies, is they feel disrespected and disregarded. The United States is now home to a wave of strikes. More and more workers are realizing we create the wealth. Why should we give it to the top? And they're on strike. Our country is in a turmoil, and the American empire that was built because every other industrialized country was destroyed after World War II, except for us, so we were the kings. We're no longer the kings. We could learn to get along with other people. We could learn to convert to a peacetime economy. We could use the trillion dollars, almost a trillion that we spend every year on armaments, to have Medicare for all, to have universal child care, to have universal summer care for children, 
to have better schools, to have decent jobs, to have a $20 minimum wage. You know, in Denmark, McDonald's workers get the minimum wage, which is $24, hour, $24 an hour. And they do quite well, and so does McDonald's in Denmark. We could stop the outrageous profiteering and abandonment of our country. We could have safe energy. We could have a green economy. The biggest line item in our budget is armaments. Why? And Americans keep allowing that to happen. The Defense Department gets more than the CDC, more than the Environmental Protection Agency, more than the Bureau of Education. We have to change this because that violence on a national level and that idea that you solve your problems by going to war, the United States does have a problem. Its hegemony, its dominance over the world is diminishing. The first big empire after World War II to emerge from World War II as the winner was the Soviet Union. It collapsed out of its own corruption. We're the second great empire, and we too face collapse out of our own corruption or a return to fascism to hold this capitalism together or a realization, okay, we are now part of a different world and we can play an important part of it and we could be an exemplary country, exemplifying not only democracy, which means that we can't have bribery in our elections, we can't have the people paying like the NRA with its 250 million a year to keep afloat a government that supports corporate military producers and armaments producers, but we could be the leaders of democracy. We could, if we stopped that, be the leaders in care for our own people instead of being far behind. We're the only nation that doesn't have maternity leaves and some paternity leaves and childcare allowances and family allowances and paid vacations. There is no developed country that offers so little to its citizens. We could excel there. And we could save the money that we spend on vast and losing military enterprises to sustain our own people, to improve our lives. But how could we do this? Well, there's some obvious intermediary steps, like passing gun laws, like eliminating the filibuster. We could do what Australia did after a huge mass shooting of where 36 people were killed. The Australians, against the protestations of their gun lobby, passed safety checks. They bought back a lot of weapons. They stopped selling guns to anyone who wasn't 27 years old or older. They demanded that everyone who buy a gun register and register that gun and go to gun safety classes. So they didn't have a large number of guns around their houses that anyone could pick up. That helped. Of course, gun laws would be a beginning, but also we'd have to stop the culture of violence and war that takes our, our money and that creates an environment of war in this country. And how could we do that? Well, let's look at some of the successful countries in the world who have stopped that. One is Portugal, which for the past at least 10 years has been ruled by a coalition of the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, and the Green Party. They have legalized drugs and cut down drug use by 75%. They have enacted all sorts of green energy. They have created 
therapy places where people who want to stop being addicted can do so for free. They have put in free health care and child care. Okay, they could do it. We could do exactly what Chile is doing right now. Chile had a socialist revolution. And they had a revolution because they combined all the movements into one united socialist movement. Americans have many disparate movements. We have climate safety and climate opposition to climate extinction. We have Black Lives Matter. We have a feminist movement. We have the LGBTQIA rights movements. But all of them are in different places. We used to have a peace movement and we could have one again. We have voting rights movements. We need to unite. We need to unite under a socialist banner. And that will not be the corporate controlled Democratic Party. We have to face that we have two capitalist parties from which to choose. The Republicans, which are more and more fascistic, and the Democrats, which are co-opted and controlled by the corporate sector. We have to have a party that stands for people, a people's party, an employee's party, a green party, a progressive party, whatever we want to call it, where we have a basic socialist commitment, which is committed to climate change, racial equality, sexual choice and sexual equality, labor and labor benefits, because labor was a very important part of the winning coalition in Chile. And the labor movement is becoming increasingly progressive. The Amazon Labor Union just won a warehouse of 8,000 people, and that's an independent union. And it won in spite of the fact that people at Amazon were forced into special sessions where they had to listen to why they shouldn't join the union, where at first until um, it was decided against them, they didn't allow the Amazon labor union to organize on their property. Chris Smalls, who was one of the leaders of that union, got arrested for talking to people outside of the factory, the warehouse. And that really did give a big boost to the labor unions inside because it was so unjust. They arrested him for trespassing on company property because after work, they had food for people who just came off their shifts and they talked to people and all around them were other food purveyors who didn't get arrested. But labor is changing. Sarah Nelson, who heads the flight attendants union, a very militant union that was the only union to suggest a general strike when they wanted the inspection agents and the workers in the airports to work for nothing. The AFL-CIO did not back her up. She's not running for the position of president of the AFL-CIO. She thought about it, but she now thinks that an independent labor union is a much better bet because the AFL-CIO has been compromised by their state ties to the State Department by the fact that they get huge salaries when their workers don't and is the beginning of a new labor movement which would need to unite with the other movements to create a mass party that would stop us from spending our money on militarism 
and armaments all over the world and in the United States. It would stop us from selling cheap our military equipment that we're no longer using to the police departments. So they have very sophisticated stun guns and weapons. We could do that. Other people have. We could. And I think actually it is beginning to happen. I'm old and I haven't seen for at least 50 years the mobilization that has occurred here with the latest threat to our reproductive freedom. Women have mobilized and are mobilizing again. In the latest demonstrations I attended, there were hundreds of thousands of people across the United States. And unlike what our demonstrations were in the 1960s and early 70s, at least a quarter of the people were men. They were all colors, they were both genders, and of course they were also LGBTQIA participants welcomed. Everyone was welcomed. Along with the climate change people, because obviously the war in Ukraine, which we are arming like crazy, is a terrible threat to the planet. These explosive devices will, bring, will help bring about the end of our planet. And so that we have the possibility to end this slaughter, this slaughter in America, where 300,000 people die of guns, where children's main cause of death is guns, where we allow the bribery of our officials through campaign contributions. Those things will change when we mobilize, when we're in the street, when we have a party that serves us. And I really believe that we can do it. There are so many signs that this will happen. I should mention, of course, that this happened just recently in Argentina, a Catholic country where they passed abortion. They forbid illegal abortion. They wrecked the abortion laws that they had on the books and allow access to abortion for everyone, even though the Pope himself flew there to stop it. But there, the labor unions that are progressive, the indigenous people, the ecology people and the climate extinction people, the minority organizing people, and all the others got together and demanded no with one voice. And they won. And I sincerely believe that this is a time that our country is in terrible trouble. We have lost all the wars we fought since World War II, even though we spent many trillions on them. We are spending close to a trillion dollars a year and are highly ineffective. We have to accept that empire and militarism is not what's going to save the world, it's what's going to destroy the planet and work together. And I believe if we do, when we do, we'll win. Thank you.